For Bangladeshis, flooding is a way of life. With its mix of monsoons and cyclones, one quarter of the country is underwater at some time of the year. Their lives are very much shaped by these forces. And when you travel to the southwest of, of Bangladesh, you see one way that they've tried to deal with that, which is polders that are designed to hold back the water. But what they're learning is that trying to hold back the water comes with a price. My name is Warren Cornwall. I'm a contributing correspondent for Science Magazine. This reporting was supported partly by funding from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Polder is a Dutch word. They used it to reclaim a lot of land for farmland, but the river systems there aren't nearly as dynamic as they are in Bangladesh. So, you know, a number of people in Bangladesh said, you take Dutch solutions and you apply them to Bangladeshi problems, and you can wind up with some unexpected consequences. Well, Bangladesh, they built this infrastructure, you know, half a century ago to protect themselves from flooding. Almost the entire southwest coastal region ringed by embankments. Uh, Polder is a really big island. Polder 32, for example, is about 80 square kilometers, and more than 30,000 people live there. Because polders impede the natural movement of water and sediment, the rivers are filling with silt. Lands inside the polders are being starved of new soil that would otherwise flow in. And now these lands are sinking. That means when a polder is flooded, the areas inside the walls turn into bathtubs. That's what happened to Polder 32 in 2009. A wave of water originating from Cyclone Isla combined with strong currents burst through the polder. It was one of several polders damaged during the cyclone, which is blamed for 150 deaths and $270 million in damages in Bangladesh. Studying the aftermath, researchers found that land just outside Polder 32 was 10 centimeters above the typical high tide, which suggests that the land would only be swamped by the highest tides. And inside the polder, researchers found the influx of water brought silt, more than a third of a meter on average. So a team of researchers concluded that rather than relying on taller walls, they should think about introducing controlled flooding to raise the land. This approach is not without precedent in Bangladesh. A region 30 kilometers inland tried to harness natural forces and use controlled flooding starting in the 1990s. Inland polders are designed to protect against flooding by seawater, driven far up river channels during high tide. But these rivers, with smaller, slower currents, started clogging with silt when they were trapped between polders. Farms and towns inside some of the polders have become waterlogged, stewing in stagnant water for months. Desperate farmers finally decided to cut gaps in the walls to let the water in. And that had this interesting effect where suddenly you had the rivers being able to flow back into the land, brought the extra sediment into the land, so the land started to get built back up after years of being starved of sediment. And then the rivers also became unblocked because the sediment had somewhere to go besides the riverbeds. This initial success led the government to develop a controlled flooding program for inland polders a decade ago. The latest program is on the Kobadok River. There, workers dug a canal connecting the river to a wetland called a beal inside the polder. Visit today and the effects are evident. Half a meter of fresh land has been gained in some parts of the beal. The river runs deep and fast. Water is once again draining from the nearby polders enabling farmers to resume planting and cultivating fields that had been waterlogged. The endangered Ganges River dolphin returned with the river's flow. But it's not all good news. The beal won't be returned to cultivation for another two years, when the canal will be closed back up. I talked to a number of landowners who complained that either they hadn't been fully compensated for the land that was now underwater, and then that doesn't really do anything for the landless laborers who work on farms, but they don't own any of the farmland. The way the system is currently run, they're not compensated at all. Families have lost their homes and livelihoods. Some were relocated while others ended up living on embankments. And the land inside the polders hasn't risen evenly, with the area near the canal benefiting the most. Engineers still have a ways to go to decipher sediment dynamics and consider how best to direct flooding. The greatest challenge is convincing the people that controlled flooding will eventually pay off. Researchers found that government agencies were disconnected from locals, spawning distrust and anger that has derailed the expansion of controlled flooding measures. 
Meanwhile, sea level is projected to rise 0.4 to 1.5 meters on the coast by 2100, putting Bangladesh at even greater risk in the future. Back downstream, in places like Polder 32, there are currently no plans to implement controlled flooding. Instead, they're rebuilding the walls. This is basically like hitting the refresh button, rebuilding these polders to withstand what's expected in 2050. As long as the polder walls keep the storm surges at bay, in some sense, you know, these folks are okay, right? But it's when something breaks that you appreciate how vulnerable they are and how the polders have actually made them more vulnerable.